um, and welcome here to this uh, session. Uh, luckily, not one of the last sessions, so I'm still not in the way of your uh, beers at the bar. So uh, that's good. Uh, but you all made it, so I'm very happy. And um, we're going to talk today about Python, and we're going to talk specifically about mistakes you could make in your Python code, uh, what they can do security-wise, and also obviously what you can do to fix them. Um, my name is Christopher van der Maade. I'm a developer advocate working for Cisco. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here today um, to talk to you about this. So a little bit about myself. My name I already mentioned. Um, I'm half Dutch, half American, but I lived my entire life in the Netherlands, which is pretty close. It was an hour and a half flight. So it was uh, very nice. This is the first time in, I'm in Norway. And uh, yeah, it's a really nice uh, country so far. Uh, I haven't been that far between the hotel and here, but uh, it looks really good. Um, I live in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. It's a second city of the Netherlands for people that don't know it. I studied in Amsterdam though. I did, a, uh, did some neuroscience, some computer science, switched to information science. During all of this, I uh, really enjoyed uh, programming. So that really became one of my passions to write code, to automate boring stuff and fun stuff, obviously. Um, that's also how I joined Cisco as an associate systems engineer seven years ago. Uh, I worked in the Northern European team as a consultant for a couple of years. So I yeah, traveled throughout uh, the Benelux and Scandinavia, and I talked with all kinds of customers and helped them uh, advise, uh, how, yeah, basically how to uh, secure their environments and uh, also, uh, yeah, I helped uh, implement uh, solutions that Cisco offers as well. Uh, in 2020, I joined as a developer advocate in the developer relations team of uh, Cisco, uh, and I specifically focus on security. So basically, it has to do that uh, anything uh, that involves Cisco automation or programmability and security. That's sort of where, uh, where I um, work on. So a lot of different topics, a lot of fun stuff. And if you have any uh, questions specifically related to that, please uh, feel free to uh, reach out to me later uh, at the conference or, or send me a message. So enough about myself, because that's obviously not why you're here. Uh, we're here to talk about Python. So I assume since you all came to a, a talk that had Python in the title, that most people here uh, either write in Python, they might even develop uh, applications in Python, or they're interested in doing so. So maybe raise of hands who categorizes in the, that, who, who here develops in Python. All right, nice. Perfect. So also, uh, this is obviously why Python. Python is a very popular language. Um, personally, I didn't start writing code in Python. Uh, I learned it later. Um, and it's, as you all probably know, it's quite a good language to pick up. It's quite um, um, yeah, um, easy to write from a syntax perspective, easy to read as well, which is quite important. And also in one of the sort of founding statements of the, 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 of Guido von Rossum, who's the, the, the initial um, creator of Python. Also, that is, by the way, created in the Netherlands uh, on Science Park, uh, which is uh, the same place I also studied. So that's obviously uh, another reason why we're doing Python. But mainly it's popular. Uh, a lot of people use it. Also, a lot of people that might not know a lot about programming or security are using it. So that means mistakes get made. So we're here today to talk about those. Also, to prove how popular it is, I uh, looked at <laughs> Python as a programming language compared to Kim Kardashian. And uh, if, as you can see, there are a lot more Google searches uh, around Python than uh, a famous person who has millions and millions of uh, social media followers. So I thought this was a pretty a good statistic to, uh, to break the ice with today. So <clears throat> we're here. Uh, so this is the agenda, which I put in a, uh, a, f uh, a Python format. Um, we're not here to talk about the intro to Python. 
but I do have small introduction. Uh, we're then talking about developers versus security. Are they friends or not? And then we'll go through a couple of vulnerabilities uh, that can be caused by writing Python code. These are not necessarily in order of the OWASP top 10 or anything. Actually, the last one is currently number one in OWASP top 10. Uh, if you also saw um, the talk this morning, uh, that was also mentioned. And finally, we have some uh, final uh, conclusions that I'll make today. Um, so uh, yeah, enjoy and um, uh, let's uh, get started. So should you be worried about all code that you write? Uh, that's probably a question that you might ask yourself. Is there code where you should be less worried about security or, or not? So is my Hello World script uh, vulnerable? So in my opinion, not every script is top priority. If you're just testing out a simple thing and you're not going to do anything with that script ever again, and it doesn't talk to the outside of your computer, to a different uh, a system on the network or the internet, then you might not think it's that important. That being said, I think it's best practice to always try to write secure code and also to try to automate testing of your code. Um, and at minimum, you should know your code's weaknesses. And in my opinion, um, for example, if you import a certain snippet of code or a library which you're importing and you're using it, but you haven't done full research into how it's actually working, you should recognize, in my opinion, that you're not 100% sure if that piece of your code is secure. Um, However, I would definitely not. Uh, so I would definitely recommend using libraries because, of, yeah, uh, libraries have been patched and patched and patched. Usually, uh, if they're they're well maintained libraries, so they might be more secure than your own code. So know your weaknesses, and actually, to quote someone from 2,500 years ago, um, to know what you know and what you do not know, that is true knowledge. So. For example, I'll, I'll be uh, saying here, I don't know everything about Python. I also don't know everything about security. Um, so it's good to recognize that, in my opinion, and to know which part of your code might be vulnerable. OK, so um, I mentioned the OWASP top 10 already. Um, the OWASP top 10 is obviously very famous. Uh, it's the top 10 of most uh, common vulnerabilities that we see around uh, web applications uh, specifically. Um, OWASP uh, yeah, is the famous uh, organization. They publish everything for free, which is great. And they actually give a lot of tips here as well. So I'll make sure I'll po post the slides wherever it's possible. And uh, by the way, so um, I made uh, as many as possible clickable links in this deck. Uh, obviously, these you can quite easily Google. Um, so I've covered a couple of them in my session here today. And I'll mention w during the demo which uh, OWASP uh, vulnerability it is. Um, they have consolidated a couple of ones. So I'm talking about injections twice. Um, yeah, so sorry about that. Uh, maybe in a future version of this presentation, I'll cover all of them. Uh, but this was at least a good start, I was thinking. Um, so then, last intro uh, before we uh, jump into the vulnerabilities. What do you guys think about developers and security teams? Are they one team? Are they two teams? Are they friends? Are they not friends? That's, in my opinion, usually uh, yeah, sort of a discussion that might be in the workplace. Could be that these teams, uh, when they're separate, are a little bit fighting each other uh, because they have conflicted interests. Developers, they want to create features. So they have a backlog of feature requests or, or updates, and they need to uh, uh, cross stuff off the backlog as soon as possible. Um, they collaborate with the security teams when there is an investigation or a remediation happens. Uh, or whenever vulnerable code needs to be changed. But at least traditionally, these are different teams. Then you have security, where you have the AppSec team. The AppSec team is more there to ensure 
that developers write secure software and write secure code. And the SecOps team usually focuses more on when stuff uh, goes wrong, that they investigate uh, the incident and try to, to, to solve it as soon as possible. Now, because they have a conflicted interest, um, yeah, this sometimes causes uh, friction. Um, there is a very cheesy uh, um, expression, or uh, how do you say that in English? Well, anyway, uh, you'll, you'll know, <laughs> understand when I was saying it. Uh, when, you, when you have a car without seat belts, you'll probably drive slower in it, whereas if you have a car with seat belts, you'll probably drive faster. So you could also argue that if you have good security practices in place, and I would say do that in the pipeline with automated tests, developers might be able to develop faster uh, than without security. So that is something you could argue might be cheesy, but I think it's a pretty good one. Okay, so uh, we are ready to go more into um, uh, yeah, the meat of the presentation. So the first vulnerability is arbitrary code execution. Uh, arbitrary code execution is probably one of the most famous um, um, uh, vulnerabilities and attacks that you could do on those vulnerabilities. Um, and it's an attacker's ability to run any command or code on a target machine or in a target process. Uh, this is basically the definition. Um, I've done some research while uh, creating this presentation, obviously, and uh, while improving it. And what I read is that this is actually uh, the most common Python vulnerability. Um, and even though it might not be on the top of the OWASP top 10, um, but it's number three uh, uh, under injection, you would uh, still, yeah, uh, it's still very important for Python, so that's why I'm starting with it today. Um, it basically uh, happens when user inputs or any input into the script is directly passed into, for example, standard Python functions and is not validated or cleaned in any way. So a lack of input sanitization, uh, or is a fancy word for cleaning, uh, or input validation is usually uh, the reason uh, why this happens. So, um, yeah, this is definitely an important one to take away. Uh, whenever you are asking any input, make sure that you're validating and sanitizing it. It's obviously common sense to a lot of people in the room, probably, um, but still, it's uh, something that is seen a lot. So, to show you a short demo of that, um, I have here a, a very simple script, um, or a couple of lines of code, let me call it that. Um, and all we're doing is we're asking user input on line four. And um, we're basically not doing anything. The only thing we're checking if, if there wasn't any input, uh, th then we'll print no input. Otherwise, uh, what we do is we will evaluate with the eval function that input. And obviously, that is, uh, can, be, can go very wrong. I have a couple of test inputs that we could do. Um, in, in, in my case, uh, I imagine that I'm trying to make a calculator or whatever, something simple. And you can give it input like 2 times 2 or whatever. But as you can see, you, can, you could potentially also do uh, system commands uh, by doing this. So if we go and actually type the right uh, what's going on? Oh, okay, classic. All right, that's always nice. I think I did a something wrong here, <laughs> but it's okay. We're back. Uh, I had a virtual environment which I may have accidentally deleted, uh, but that's okay. I don't think we'll uh, we'll uh, hit that uh, snag anywhere. Um, so what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna run this super simple script, 
and it's going to ask us for some input. So I could do 2 times 2, and it will give a result of 4, obviously. So it's very simple, nothing wrong here. But suppose that I put in something like this, where, um, and again, the eval function, by the way, checks if it's valid Python code. If it is, it will execute that code. Um, so 2 times 2 might be nice when we're making a calculator app. But let's say we want to try something out. I'm an attacker and I want to try out something simple. And I could actually run an ls system command, so to list all files in, in that uh, directory quite simply. Now I'm not going to run this. Uh, this would remove all my directories. Uh, and uh, it would uh, iterate through it uh, and force it. So we're not going to do that. But um, as you can see, super simple example where we're not doing any validation. So how do we solve that? Now, obviously, you can reverse my previous slide. So where you're, where you're not doing validation and sanitization, this happens. So we do need to do that. So always think of... What do we want? What do we expect uh, as input? And how can we check to, to make sure that input matches what we're expecting? And block out everything else. Uh, so we want to sort of do a, uh, uh, a, a white listing model uh, to only allow a couple of things. That's probably easier than uh, and, and disallow everything else. Now, there's multiple ways of doing that. In our case, we wanted to make a calculator app so we could check, are these numbers, and is there something in between? Well, yeah, technically, you could do it. It's not really a, a neat way. Uh, but there's al also pre-built uh, modules where you can actually do a lot of this stuff uh, way easier. So with the AST Python module, for example, which uh, uh, stands uh, for abstract uh, syntax tree, and basically this will parse the input, and you can then check per uh, node in that tree what kind of input it is, and I'll, I'll show you that in a little bit. There's other, also other modules or libraries that you could use uh, to, to, to do this, so definitely don't reinvent the wheel here, um, because that's, that's not necessary. So let's see um, how we can solve this. And again, I have a uh, pretty simple um, um, couple of lines of code here. Um, let me go from bottom to top. I have that same piece of code here, basically. The only thing what I'm doing is checking if uh, uh, I'm, do I'm calling a validate function, and that validate function is over here, and I'm sending the input there um, and if this returns true, then we say, okay, it's fine. This is uh, a mathematical expression. And in here, there's an internal function, which we are calling and giving that tree that I was just talking about. So you can see here, the AST module uh, helps Python application to process trees of Python abstract syntax grammar, uh, which might sound uh, very complex. And it could get very complex, but basically what we're doing here is we're parsing it, and then we're going to check these nodes. Is it a number? Is it an expression? Is it a uni unary operation or a binary op operation? And if that all is good, we will uh, return true. Um, so we can run this as well. And again, we can do 2 plus 2. That works. By the way, I'm, I'm printing here just so that you can see what's happening, uh, what is happening. And here you can see it's a binary operation. There's two constants. Um, so it's sort of, this is the tree. Uh, it's not very, yeah, we don't need to worry too much about it. But I'm just printing it here so you can have a look at it. What we can do now. And so I did this presentation previous time, and someone dared me to, to do run the other command. <laughs> but uh, still, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm going to do it. 
Uh, but as you can see here, um, an error is now raised. We can see that it's uh, uh, different types of nodes uh, than, than we are expecting uh, before. So it might be a little bit difficult to see if you're in the back. Uh, by the way, all of this I put on my GitHub and I'll, I'll share a link uh, in the Slack. Um, but basically we're throwing an exception here. Um, and by the way, just to explain also the unary and binary uh, operations. For example, if you do negative of minus minus two, um, the result is two, two times negative. And you can see that it's now a unary operation. So that means that there's only one uh, item where we're doing the operation on. So, uh, yeah, good that you at least tried to challenge me to, to run it, but uh, I'll let you do that yourself um, <laughs> because it's on GitHub. But, and it should technically work. Um, no, but all, all jokes aside, um, it's, it's not that difficult uh, to, to create such validate uh, scripts. The nice thing is you can probably write one of these once and just reuse it for other projects. Again, there are pre-built uh, libraries as well, which you can import. Uh, so it's not difficult, but you just need to be aware of it. Um, that's the takeaway here. All right, so we've done our intro, we've done the first vulnerability. Let's uh, move on to the second one, um, which is a directory traversal attack. Um, a directory traversal attack is also, um, yeah, more a, a specific attack um, and has to do, again, uh, with certain vulnerabilities in your code. Um, could uh, very well be caused by improper uh, user input validation again. Um, it can lead to sensitive files to be exposed. So basically in a very short term what it does is you can go, uh, suppose that uh, you are in a certain directory which you will allow access to. Uh, you have smart people and doing a dot dot slash uh, type of a input where you're going back a couple of directories and then to see, hey, where do we end up? Maybe we can end up, uh, maybe we're in the, in the root and we can end up and see some kind of uh, password file or, or other secrets, uh, depending on what kind of uh, system you're running it on. So uh, therefore, it's obviously very important that you check what kind of uh, path um, is provided. Um, and it, it all has to do with that your script is not checking uh, this. Um, also, this often, so it, probably there's not a lot of cases where you will have an input where you're giving it a path. Uh, it often happens a lot in a URL as well. Um, so where you give it sort of as a parameter. And uh, so you also need to be on the lookout when the dot dot slash is URL encoded. So let's do a demo of this one as well. Um, so again, here I have a couple of easy lines of code. Um, and, whoops, this makes it less easy to read. So just for demo purposes, I'm asking for an input. Uh, probably this will happen a little bit different in an actual application or program. Um, and uh, we're just opening that file and then printing whatever is in it. I have a folder here um, which says basically hello world. Um, so it's quite simple. Um, and yeah, we can run this one. Um, and we can, for example, give it a location like this. And it will read out the content. I'm not going to go all the <laughs> do all of these things, but technically speaking, you could also do weird things and give it dot dot slash notations. I'm not going to do that right now, and reach some kind of a secret uh, location like area 51txt or so, yeah anything which is uh, in, in the etc uh, directory, for example, um, could be dangerous. But it could be just as simple as Read, reading files which you're not supposed to. 
And I think whenever an attacker can read any files or see anything that they're not supposed to, you're giving them extra information uh, to, uh, during their reconnaissance phase. Uh, so I think this is probably something that happens a lot during a reconnaissance phase or uh, yeah, when they're trying to do privilege escalation or whatever. Um, so yeah, just be careful uh, with this. So what can you do to solve it? Um, OWASP, uh, I'm going for, uh, well, let me just go in order. Sorry, sometimes I'm a little bit impulsive and I go the wrong order. Um, but uh, it's important to maintain an allowed list of files or, or set up a static save directory. This is probably the easiest way to solve this. And just to check, is whatever is trying to be reached, is it either in the allowed list of files or is it in this static save directory? Um, and uh, you probably want to work without any user input when you're using si uh, file system calls. So th there's probably no need to do that. So there's other ways of, of solving that without passing it user input. Um, also, what's probably quite important is don't store any sensitive configuration files inside of your web route um, when you're specifically talking about web applications. Um, and finally, um, uh, do not sanitize the data, um, only accept the known good. So this is what I talked about earlier. Uh, it's a lot easier to say, hey, this is allowed, anything else is not allowed. Um, so that's sort of accepting the known good. Um, and yeah, it's actually easier for both uh, parties here. Um, so how do you solve that? Um, again, I have a simple way of solving it here. I am uh, setting up a safe directory. I'm putting the whole path now, but that technically wasn't necessarily needed. Uh, what I'm doing then is I'm grabbing the real path. So I'm using the real path function out of the OS module. Um, and um, yeah, this will basically provide, we'll see in a little bit what it does, but it will eliminate any symbolic links um, like the dot dot slashes, etc. What we then do is we use the common prefix um, uh, function uh, to basically check um, yeah, what is the common prefix between the real path and um, the, my static save directory, which I set up here. Uh, I'm going to print all of it, so you'll see it in a little bit. And then I'm just <laughs> simply checking if, if uh, they are the same. So, if we give it a location of, let's say, something that's safe. So, suppose I'm giving this entire thing. You can see that the requested directory is the same as the safe directory. And we can also see basically what happens, the longest common prefix, um, uh, the longest common prefix here, uh, you can see at the bottom, let me bring it up a little bit so it's easier, um, is basically uh, the same thing um, as my static uh, safe directory. Um, now, suppose that I were to do something else like this, then you'll see that an exception is raised and that the requested directory is not the same as the save directory. Uh, we can see that the real file path, because I'm going doing that those dot dot slashes, I'm somewhere uh, behind uh, uh, here. And you can see that this was actually the real path I'm requesting. The longest common prefix is just a slash. So this is obviously not the same uh, as my static save directory. And therefore, I'm throwing the exception. So um, yeah, this is one way of solving it. There's obviously a lot of different ways you can do it. Uh, I went with the static save directory here where we're um, basically giving it a static known good, um, the on where we're only accepting the known good. All right, so we now talked about um, 
the arbitrary code execution um, and the directory traversal attack. I think the common denominator here is uh, make sure you check whatever input is given um, and uh, make sure that you know what kind of input you're expecting and yeah, validate against it. Now the next one is outdated libraries and this is probably a very common one as well. Um, it is OWASP number six, uh, I, um, so it dropped a little bit. Um, I tried to break it down very simple. Uh, libraries or modules are written by humans. Humans make mistakes, mistakes get exploited, they get patched, and then we forget to update and patch our own program. So um, yeah, probably everyone here will have done something uh, in the past. Um, and this is really why you need automation as well in your pipeline to make sure that you're checking for these kind of uh, outdated uh, libraries in your uh, code and in your repositories. So, if you look, for example, at the requests library, um, uh, the Python request library, um, this is one I use a lot. I do a lot of my scripts involve doing uh, uh, API requests, so I need to do a lot of HTTP uh, requests for that. Um, uh, but it, yeah, depending on what kind of scripts you're writing, you might use different uh, libraries. But all of these libraries, um, they usually have a change log and, and, um, and release notes. Um, and, and they'll say what, what changed, etc. Or what they also do is they'll say if there's a vulnerability. And it might be a little bit too small, I'm aware. Uh, it's not meant that you're reading all of the fine letters here. Uh, but what you can see is something red, and usually red is bad. Um, so <laughs> take it from me. But basically what happened in the requests library, uh, everything below uh, 2.20 is uh, yeah, stamped as insecure. Um, and there's, yeah, there's also a vulnerability about this uh, that has been published. There's a lot of information on it. Basically what happens um, is that you can do a um, HTTPS to HTTP redirect and the authorization header will then basically be passed to an HTTP URI instead of HTTPS. So it makes it quite easy for attackers to sniff the authorization header. And yeah, well, obviously the authorization header could be a bearer token or, or some kind of a uh, token that is needed to make that API request. Um, so this makes it very easy for an attacker to, to whatever you're trying to reach, do reach that same uh, destination and use your token uh, to do so. And yeah, well, uh, you can probably guess what, what kind of uh, results they are if it's a GET request or uh, then you might be able to read uh, certain information which you shouldn't and probably maybe even more dangerous if you're doing post, puts or whatever that you're actually changing data as well can be very, very harmful. Um, now, how do you solve this? You can solve this obviously by patching your uh, code and updating and obviously also testing it. Um, so that's quite logical. Um, and um, to make sure that your packages are not vulnerable. Um, now, I assume this is yeah not too difficult, uh, but it, when you are bringing this into production, it's probably more difficult because you need to automatically test to make sure that your script is still working with that new library. Uh, um, so um, yeah, that's, that's an important one. Also, how do you know when one of your libraries are vulnerable. Well, for that, there are a couple of good uh, solutions out there, um, and I'll, I'll name a few. Uh, so we have SAS, DAST, IAST, and RASP. Um, a SAS, uh, um, and I think this was also mentioned in the beginning, uh, a SAS is basically, as, well, as, as, the, uh, uh, as it says, it's a static application security testing. What that means, is it looks only at your code. 
in static form. So you're not running it or you're not doing any kind of uh, test with it. You're literally looking at the code and seeing if there's any vulnerabilities in there or if there's any vulnerable libraries in there. Um, so this is called a SAST, um, and uh, there's a lot of free SASTs out there. There's actually one built into uh, GitHub as well, which I'll show you in a little bit how to work with that. All right, I saw there's actually another session, so you might want to look that one back. I think it uh, was two sessions before me. Uh, that is on how to use security settings in GitHub, uh, and they're actually quite powerful. Um, Dynamic application security testing, on the other hand, is uh, not static, but dynamic this time. So what does that mean? So this time it looks at uh, run, the running of the code, um, and it is not looking at the code itself. So it's only looking at what is basically what the code is doing. Um, so this is, um, kind of, they call it black box testing, because you can't see what's happening inside of it. You're just looking at whatever's coming out of it and going in. Um, then interact interactive application security testing is simply said kind of a little bit of a, a combination of the two um, because there is an actual agent. Uh, so you, you're running the code, but there's usually an agent on uh, the server or the, the wherever the code is running. And uh, it combines both the output and input of uh, the program with the actual lines of code. This is still all happening in staging. So this is usually happening in the quality assurance phase or life cycle, whatever you want to call it, of, uh, of your code. Um, it's not in production. Obviously, that's why it has the T as, uh, uh, of testing as last one. Now, a RASP, uh, on the other hand, is um, uh, gaining a lot of popularity. Um, obviously, I'm not saying you shouldn't use these, but a RASP, on the other hand, is actually running in production. So this is really not really a security tool anymore uh, or a testing tool, but it's more of a security solution. Um, so there's a couple of advantages of it. Um, first of all, because it's running in the runtime of your production script, uh, you can actually stop attacks from happening as well. Um, also, in your testing phase, you're obviously testing for whatever is known at that point. So uh, whatever kind of vulnerabilities or outdated libraries you can check on at that point in time, uh, that's what you're catching. But everything, when you release it to production, whenever something new is discovered, yeah, you're already out of the testing phase and you're in production, so you can't catch it anymore. A RASP obviously can catch that if you have a RASP that updates uh, automatically. Uh, and, as I mentioned, a RASP can also stop the attacks from happening. I'll talk a little bit more about a RASP at the end of uh, my presentation here. Let's do a quick time check. Um, so, GitHub, as I mentioned, actually has a SAS built in for free. Uh, well, yeah, uh, mainly for free. So um, you could actually, uh, in this case, in this repository, by the way, this is the repository with my sample uh, uh, codes that I'm using today. Uh, you can enable um, a lot of different tools. Uh, for example, you can enable uh, CodeQL, which is a built-in SAS from GitHub. Um, this is for free, I think, up to 50,000 or, or a big number of minutes. And as you can see here, though, uh, when you, can, you, you have s uh, specific settings. For example, whenever you push code to your repository, then you run a test. Uh, th that could be something you can do. Um, it, as you can see here, it ran for 2 minutes and 41 seconds. Uh, this wasn't a huge push, actually, that I did to check this. So I'm not sure how quick you will reach the free amount of minutes of GitHub, so definitely double check that. And also something I noticed when I was reading in the small letters is that if you have an automatic renew subscription with GitHub, 
I suppose that you have a pro uh, account. I think it will automatically also deduct this money from your account. So it is free, but uh, please read the small letters. Um, so code QL is pretty cool. It uh, allows you to check code of a lot of different languages, uh, amongst which is Python, obviously. Um, so that is quite nice. There's a default sort of library of things that it checks, but you can also add on to that. Uh, and I think you can also uh, contribute to sort of the default um, uh, database that it's using. The Pendabot, um, which is not a pretty nice name, um, is a bot in built into GitHub which automatically scans for vulnerable dependencies. And there's a couple of settings for the Pendabot. <coughs> and um, uh, you can set it up to automatically do these scans. And you can even set it up to automatically do pull requests to fix it as well. Um, here, for exa uh, as, um, as example, what I did is I added a requirements.txt file to this repository, which said um, that I'm using the request library 2.19. Uh, whatever. Um, I, I have it here as well. So it's a very simple requirements uh, file, as you can see. Um, and basically, this triggered the Pendabot to, uh, to alert. Um, and you can see as well that it's a high severity one. Um, uh, well, actually, it's moderate. Well, anyway. Um, what it says, it will give more information. It will tell me exactly where the mistake was made. Um, it will say the affected versions, so 2.19.1 and lower. And it will also give you the patch version. Um, all of this information is also on the NIST uh, link that, uh, that I share shared earlier. Um, and I think you can also link uh, directly to that uh, CVE from here. If you then enable the automatic pull request, it will automatically fix your code for you, which is quite can be quite nice. Um, and you might want to build this into your pipeline uh, to use either the Pendabot or a similar uh, tool. Um, obviously, you need to be careful um, when you're doing such automated updates. It could be that something has changed in, in requests uh, which actually has an effect on how you're doing, how you have to structure your your API call that you're doing, or or whatever kind of request that you're doing. So be be careful uh, about that. So you probably want to build in some more automated testing to make sure that everything is working fine when you're doing uh, this kind of automation. Um, but I hope that speaks for itself. All right. So we. Covered outdated libraries now as well. Um, I think the big takeaway here is be mindful of your requirements.txt files when you're talking about Python. I think if you're doing pip freeze, so if you're using a virtual environment, it will create and then output it into a requirements.txt file. I think it automatically does the equals, uh, uh, the double equal uh, symbol. Um, uh, which means, yeah, it could uh, be vulnerable at some point in time. So be careful about that. So next up is uh, Python assertions. This is quite a simple and potentially uh, too stupid one, but uh, it does happen a lot that assertions are being used uh, instead of as a debug tool, more as an error checking tool or or a tool to 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 you to um, apply logic, um, and when you're doing that, that's fine. When you're testing, uh, totally makes sense. But uh, when you're running code in production, assertions are usually turned off. So whatever you were trying to check is not being checked anymore. So if you're actually checking something important and throwing in, and your code depends on throwing an error, then then uh, and you forget to change that to an actual if condition. Uh, or, or an exception or whatever, then your code can be terribly vulnerable. Um, so, 
Uh, and by the way, as for assertions uh, or the assert uh, f um, function in Python, uh, you're checking a condition. Uh, so it's, um, I'll show you that right now, what it does, uh, for those that are not aware. Um, so here I'm doing a very simple assert, obviously, to show you uh, what can go wrong. Um, uh, we have a variable called foo, or it's called <laughs> far to assert, but it has the value of a string ca uh, called foo. We're asserting if that's uh, the value a variable is foo. Um, obviously, a, a completely useless assertion. Um, basically, what it says is if the variable um, uh, equals foo, then do nothing. However, if it contains bar in this case, then we're going to throw an assertion error. So we can also run this, obviously. And you can see here that there's an assertion error. Let me pull it up a little bit again. Um, actually, that didn't help too much. But what you can see here is there's an assertion error. Um, and that happened on line 10. Now suppose that we comment out this one, just to show you. We can also do a custom message in our, um, uh, in our assert uh, error, assertion error, as you can see here. Um, now again, this might seem very trivial, um, but it happens a lot that during testing and during debugging, that you're using assertions for something that is actually quite important. Suppose that you want to check uh, if a specific ID in a request matches the ID of the logged in user. I don't know, something like that. If that assertion actually doesn't happen, that means that check doesn't happen anymore. And that means you just uh, have a vulnerability. Now, actually, you can also, uh, just to prove you, um, how you can run code without doing any assertions. If you're uh, giving it the um, this flag, so that's the capital O, then um, you can see that I'm printing something and that is here printed. So all of my assertions are not happening anymore. So this is a simple um, vulnerability that can happen, um, but uh, I did see it a lot around. Personally, I've never done it. I have definitely done other of these uh, mistakes, but I, I haven't done uh, this one. Um, but how do you solve it? Do not use Python for logic. Um, assertions are probably disabled in, in production anyway. Uh, they're not an error handling tool, it's a debugging tool. So, um, an easy one, but now we're getting to the the most important one of today, because this one, the last uh, vulnerability or type of attack that we're talking about is um, exploitation of access control. And um, yeah, the name basically mentions it. If you have a web application or an application with an authentication system built in, then uh, if you're not doing certain checks, uh, as I just mentioned, by the way, a good check is to, to, uh, to make sure that no privilege escalation is done, is to check is the ID of the logged in user same as the ID of the request that is being made. Um, that is an easy check that you can do. Uh, it actually so it moved up from number five to number one. 94% of apps were tested for some form of broken access control. Um, I understand why, because access control is obviously uh, a more difficult topic than, for example, assertions. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I understand that, uh, but that, that's why I wanted to end with this one, uh, that you take it away. Please be very mindful when you're doing this. And, um, yeah, some of the examples is that you're not uh, doing the principle of least privilege or zero trust or whatever you want to call it. If you're not implementing that correctly, so, you log in and then you can do everything. Well, that's usually not a good idea. So you only want to show um, or give access to that logged in user to whatever 
that user should have access to, nothing else. Um, you can also do a key identifier change, um, uh, which I'll, I'll show an example of, uh, of in a little bit. Or you could do privilege escalation. And a privilege escalation could be that you're logged in as a read-only user or whatever, um, and you're trying to become read-write or an admin or whatever types of roles that you might have. Now here you see an example of, uh, of where the ID and key and secret are being passed as parameters. Uh, as an attacker, I could, for example, try to, to make changes to this, uh, make changes to the ID, um, um, uh, for example, and try if I can log into a different account. It's quite simple, but therefore it's quite important that you're doing your checks correctly. Now, how do you solve this, these kind of attacks? So this was just a very basic uh, example. Um, you need to do validation and verification again, which I mentioned a lot of times today. You need to have role-based permissions or object-level permissions. Uh, this has to do with the least privilege uh, principle or zero trust principle. Also, often people talk about authentication or, or off, and they mean authentication. But in my opinion, uh, you have triple A, so you should always forget, or you should never forget, authorization and accounting. Um, authoriz uh, authentication obviously is just checking who are you, can you log in. Uh, authorization is what are you allowed to do, so what are you authorized to do. And accounting means that we're actually logging all of the logins uh, and steps that someone is taking, so that if something goes wrong, we can trace it back. So make sure that you're not forgetting the two A's uh, that are behind the A of authentication. Now, I would definitely not tell you to, um, uh, to come up with your own authentication mechanism. Um, there are a lot of pre-built systems in, in frameworks like Flask or Django. Um, and for example, Flask uh, has Flask login which is a pre-built uh, mechanism to do authentication. Uh, Flask login does lack uh, authorization. So basically all it is doing is authenticating users. Um, on the other hand, Django has a little bit more sophisticated pre-built uh, authentication mechanism, um, which does allow you to do a couple of extra things straight out of the box. Uh, by the way, I'm not bashing Flask. There's also a lot of add-ons, obviously, which you can easily use to, uh, to do that kind of stuff. Um, so I actually have them open here, and I just wanted to, uh, I have the links here as well, but I just wanted to show you how easy it is uh, here to, to work with, um, let me zoom a little bit, to work with this, because basically uh, what you're doing is you can just import this directly, and by doing that, if you, for example, import uh, this uh, user um, a class from um, the Django dot, uh, uh, off. Um, you can see that you can just create a user and, um, and uh, save that user. And the nice thing is if you, if you go a little bit further, um, you can also do authentications very easily um, with, for example, Django. So there's no need to reinvent this. Um, it is now number one as, uh, as you're uh, on the OWASP top 10. But I think if you properly implement uh, things like, uh, like Django or Flask or whatever you're using, then it doesn't have to be too difficult. Um, and, and just like with um, Django, here we can also import Flask login and start doing um, things quite easily, as you can see here, with users, uh, getting those users. Uh, important though, what they say in the beginning here um, is um, that, yeah, they're not doing anything beyond logged in or not. So they're only doing authentication basically. So be mindful of the, the lack of authorization on the yeah, pre-built Flask login uh, feature. Um, by the way, 
Uh, this is also a, a good check, which you can also do to stop, for example, privilege, escalation, or other uh, malicious intent. Um, <coughs> if a request comes in, um, also pass the account ID. This, by the way, for, for uh, Django. Um, and check if the user ID of the request is the same of the user ID from that account. And uh, if that is the case, then you know, OK, the request and the, the account are the same. Uh, if not, then uh, yeah, you probably want to raise an exception or uh, uh, kill, kill the session and uh, do some kind of a alerting to your team uh, because uh, it could be a sign of an attack. OK, we are nearing the top of the hour. So that means uh, I should also be done talking uh, soon. So we have also covered all of the five vulnerabilities uh, or attacks that I, uh, that I wanted to show you today. As a final uh, steps, I just want to show you what you can do next. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to show you. But first of all, um, this quote again, to know what you know and what you do not know, that is true knowledge. So I think this is a very important statement. Keep it in mind. Um, research on what you don't know. Uh, don't try to reinvent the wheel uh, whenever you are doing, um, uh, uh, w whenever you're writing code and you need to do something that might be a little bit more difficult, like authentication. Um, I'm... Uh, so there are some things Cisco can do as well. So usually people see Cisco as a networking company. Um, we actually have a, a new solution um, called AppDynamics, which is both uh, performance monitoring, but it's also a RASP, uh, so runtime application self-protection. And it's actually part of a more broader uh, application-first um, security um, framework, uh, which you can definitely uh, check out as well, um, just, which is this framework, uh, which yeah you can use to secure applications both from the inside out, but also the actual infrastructure that it's uh, running on. Then uh, I told you already I have a couple of cool uh, links which you should check out in uh, in the slides. I'll, I'll share the slides. I think it's probably allowed to share them in the Slack. Um, also, a couple of other things I wanted to, to shout out to. Secure Code Warrior, I'm a big fan of. I saw that they're actually here. I didn't know that beforehand. But uh, Secure Code Warrior is something where you can uh, educate yourself on writing secure code. They have it in Python, but they also have it in, in different languages. So uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to grab uh, a beer or something in repayment because of this plug. But uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Secure Code Warrior, so I would recommend checking it out. There's obviously a lot other uh, educational platforms that you could use. Um, also, uh, my GitHub is here. Uh, remove the last part and just go to my regular GitHub if you're interested into other projects that I'm working on. And uh, yeah, I'm always open to collaborate on, on projects, um, so uh, yeah, definitely reach out to me. With that, we can cross out the last step of the agenda, and there's nothing else for me to thank you for your time, and please reach out to me if, uh, if you have anything uh, that you want to say to me. So thanks, and enjoy the rest of the event, and enjoy the party tonight. <laughs>